Hello everyone, welcome to Easy Medicine. Today we are going to discuss this topic from respiratory system that is pleural effusion. We are going to discuss this topic in this brief outline starting with the anatomy, etiology, the clinical features, evaluation and management of pleural effusion. Let's start with the anatomy and the development of pleural fluid. Here we have the parietal pleura and here is the visceral pleura and the space enclosed between them is nothing but the pleural space. And on the inner side we have the bronchial capillaries and the pulmonary capillaries, the clustered structures of alveoli and the supporting tissue which is nothing but the interstitium. On the side of parietal pleura we have the intercostal capillaries. All these capillaries surrounding the pleura will result in the development of the pleural fluid and the pleural fluid is drained by the lymphatics in the parietal pleura. Now the normal quantity of pleural fluid is 5 to 15 ml in a normal individual. It requires 300 ml for the clinical identification. Let's see how will the pleural fluid accumulate. The pleural fluid accumulation requires an increased entry or a decreased exit. The increased entry could be because of an increased vascular permeability or a decreased oncotic pressure or an increased hydrostatic pressure. Right? This oncotic pressure and the hydrostatic pressure are nothing but the starling forces which play a significant role in the balance of fluid in the body. So when there is an increased capillary permeability that will result in the high protein exudate. That is the protein rich fluid from the capillaries will seep in into the pleural space and fill it. On the other hand, decreased exit can happen because of lymphatic obstruction or damage and all these three causes a reduced oncotic pressure, an increased hydrostatic pressure or a lymphatic obstruction can result in the formation of a low protein fluid in the pleural space and that is a transudate. Now let's see the causes of transudative effusion and exudative effusion. The transudative effusion again is because of an increased hydrostatic pressure or a decreased oncotic pressure. And the common etiologies are, the most common one is congestive heart failure and followed by the chronic liver disease, nephrotic syndrome, hypothyroidism, SVC obstruction, then we have peritoneal dialysis and urinothorax. All these are the causes of transudative effusion. Then on the other hand, we have the exudative effusion. The exudative effusion is because of increased capillary permeability. And the etiologies are V for vascular pulmonary embolism, then infections. It could be a bacterial infection, fungal infection or a viral infection. The most common cause of exudative pleural effusion is tubercular effusion or tuberculosis. And we also have dramatic or iatrogenic causes where the hemothorax or post CABG or post radiation can be the causes for an exudative pleural effusion. When you look at the autoimmune causes, we have SLE and RA, then we have certain neoplastic causes like mesothelioma, metastasis and Meigs syndrome. Then we also have certain drugs like amiodarone, nitrofurantoin, bromocryptine and methysergite. We have certain other, other causes like chylothorax, which is deposition of the chylomicrons or the triglycerides or pseudochylothorax where there is cholesterol deposition, esophageal perforation, pancreatitis, post myocardial infarction pericarditis or Dressler syndrome, yellow nail syndrome. So all these causes can result in exudative pleural effusion. Now let's look at two uncommon causes. One is chylothorax, another one is a pseudochylothorax. The chylothorax is commonly because of trauma or thoracic surgery where there could be a damage to the thoracic duct or lymphatic obstruction. This will result in the deposition of the chylomicrons in the pleural space that will result in this milky fluid in the pleural space. So when you look at the pleural fluid analysis of this patient, you will find triglyceride level more than 110 milligram per deciliter in the if analysis and the treatment would be an intercostal chest tube insertion. Now you also have the pseudochylothorax or a cholesterol effusion. This is because of the cholesterol deposition in the pleural space and the supposed cause is a chronic exudative effusion. The exact mechanism for this effusion is not known but the supposed mechanism is that the RBC and WBC lies and which will further result in the release of their intracellular lipids into the pleural space and they are not readily reabsorbed by the thick end pleural membranes. And when you look at the pleural fluid analysis, the cholesterol levels are significantly elevated 200 milligram per deciliter. 
Now let's look at the clinical features. The common clinical features in a patient of pleural effusion are dyspnea, cough and pleuritic chest pain. Dyspnea is because the lung is being compressed with the fluid and the alveoli will not be able to expand with air. And pleuritic chest pain will be there in the initial phases of pleural effusion where the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura rub against each other and there is inflammation in the stage of pleuritis. But when, the gra when gradually the fluid deposits in the pleural cavity, the pleural layers move away from each other and the pleuritic chest pain disappears. And on physical examination, you will find diminished movements of chest wall on inspection and on palpation you will find a reduced vocal primitives and on percussion you will find a dull note or a stony dull note and on auscultation you will find a decreased breath sounds or absent breath sounds and the vocal resonance is also reduced in this patient. Now when you look at evaluation, the basic investigation that is required here is a chest x-ray. Uh, that is a radiological investigation which is a chest x-ray or a CT scan. Chest x-ray is quite readily available but it requires at least a 200 ml for it to be recognized by a chest x-ray peer view. And when you talk about the sensitivity of radiological investigations, the CT is the most sensitive one with a sensitivity of 5 to 10 ml followed by an ultrasound followed by a chest x-ray lateral decubitus view followed by a chest x-ray PA view. Now what are the findings on a chest x-ray PA view? Initially you will see CP blunting or the cardiophrenic angle blunting at a volume of 200 ml. The diaphragmatic contour is lost at 500 ml deposition and the meniscus sign or a concave upward curved opacity may be seen, it is called as the meniscus sign and the fourth rib is operated with the volume deposition of 1000 ml. These are the different radiographic findings that you see on a chest x-ray. Now after you found out that the patient is having pleural effusion, the next step would be to do thoracosynthesis. Thoracosynthesis should be done only when you suspect an exudative effusion but not translative effusion because treating the cause for the translative effusion will be sufficient for resolution of the pleural fluid. Now look at this first image. You can see both the right and left sides the CP angle is blunted. This is a case of bilateral pleural effusion and the causes are the all translative effusions. In the second image you can see there is significant right sided pleural effusion. The common causes are hepatic hydrothorax, meek syndrome and peritoneal dialysis. As you can see in all these three causes the fluid deposition in the right sided hemithorax or right pleural effusion is because of the transition or the movement of fluid from the abdominal cavity into the right pleural cavity. This happens because there are more number of diaphragmatic defects on the right side when you compare it with the left side. And here is the third image where you can see the left sided pleural effusion and the common causes are esophageal rupture, pancreatitis, post CABG and Dressler syndrome. Now let's look at the thoracentesis procedure. Initially the patient preferred position is the patient should be sitting upright with leaning forward and arms should be elevated but resting on a table or a bed. The insertion site is the area of triangle of safety where it is bounded anteriorly by the lateral edge of the pectoralis major, posteriorly by the lateral edge of latissimus dorsi and below or the base of the triangle is formed by the horizontal level of the fifth intercostal space. Remember, you should insert the needle just above the rib, not below the rib because the neurovascular bundle is located just within the rib. And if at all possible, if you have an ultrasound available, you should use the ultrasound for doing this procedure. Now, after you've done this thoracosynthesis, you have collected the pleural fluid, now send it for analysis. So the pleural fluid analysis should be sent for glucose, protein, LDH, Cytology that is total count and differential count, then microscopy, gram stain, acid fast stain, culture and sensitivity, pH, adenosine deaminase and certain special tests for specific diseases. So what are the common findings that you see in a normal pleural fluid? Grossly it appears clear and the glucose is equal to the top plasma glucose. The protein is usually in the range of 1 to 2 gram per deciliter. The WBC is less than 1000 per ml and LDH is less than 50% of the serum. pH is 7.6. This is the picture that you see in a normal pleural fluid. But the first step will be to identify whether it is a transudate or an exudate. For that you need this LIGHTS criteria. The LIGHTS criteria differentiates transudate and an exudate. This is supposed to be met if at least one of the three following is present. Starting with the first one, 
a plural fluid protein to serum protein ratio is more than 0.5 or the plural fluid LDH to serum LDH ratio is more than 0.6. The thirdly, plural fluid LDH is more than two thirds of the upper limit of normal for serum LDH. If any of these three criteria is satisfied, then this satisfies Light's criteria and the patient's effusion is because of an exudate, not transudate. Sometimes the Light's criteria may also misdiagnose a transudate or an exudate. If you are suspecting a transudative effusion, even though the Light's criteria has shown an exudative effusion, then you can apply these two points. One is the serum to plural fluid protein gradient. If this protein gradient is more than 3.1 gram per deciliter, then it is a transudate. If the albumin gradient, that is a serum minus plural fluid albumin is more than 1.2 gram per deciliter, again that confirms transudate. So if the lights criteria has shown to be having an exudate, but if you are suspecting a transudate, then apply these two points, then see if at all the protein gradient is more than 3.1 the albumin gradient is more than 1.2. If any of these two is present, then the fluid is likely a transudate. Now let's look at the gross appearance of the plural fluid and the likely cause and the key tests that have to be done. If the fluid is turbid, the probable cause could be an infected empyema or tuberculosis. Infected causes like empyema or tuberculosis and the key tests that have to be done are the pH, LDH and microbiological investigations. If the gross appearance is milky, the likely causes are the chylothorax or the pseudochylothorax and for ruling them out, you need triglycerides, cholesterol or chylomicrons. If the plural fluid is bloody, the likely causes are hemothorax and malignancy and for ruling out, you need hematocrit and cytology of the plural fluid. If the gross appearance is black, then the likely causes could be fungal infection or pancreatico pleural fistula and for identifying them, you need fungal culture amylase and cytology. And lastly, if the gross appearance is green, then it could be because of biliary leak or rheumatoid arthritis. And the key tests that are required for identification are the bilirubin and rheumatoid factor of the pleural fluid. So these are certain gross appearances and the likely causes of the pleural effusion. Now let's look at the glucose, pH and the different cytological measures that will help in the diagnosis of a patient. If the glucose is less than 60, the probable causes could be a tuberculosis, empyema or a paranemonic effusion, rheumatoid arthritis and malignancy. In malignancy, the malignant cells have consumed glucose there. In tuberculosis, again, tuberculous bacteria has consumed glucose there. In empyema, again, bacteria has consumed. And if the pH is less than 7.3, the probable causes could be tuberculosis, empyema, RA or SLE or malignancy. And there could be an elevated polymorphonuclear leukocytes if they are more than 10,000 per microliter, common cause could be a paranemonic effusion. And if the counts are more than 50,000 per microliter, the probable cause could be a empyema or lupus. Increased lymphocytes can be seen in tuberculosis, rheumatoid arthritis, malignancy and lymphoma. Now the increased eosinophils. Increased eosinophils can be seen in malignancy, infections like bacterial, fungal and parasitic infections, Trauma because of hemothorax or pneumothorax, pulmonary infarction, drug-induced, Churg-Strauss syndrome, hemothorax or post-coronary artery bypass graft. All these causes can result in eosinophilic pleural effusion. Now lastly, let's look at some special investigations that are required for identifying certain specific diseases. So if you are suspecting any special pathology, then you will have to do this special investigation starting with amylase which is elevated in esophageal perforation or pancreatitis. Then if you are suspecting hemothorax, do a hematocrit. If it is more than half of the blood, then it identifies as hemothorax. The creatine may be elevated if the effusion is because of urinothorax. Triglycerides are more than 110 milligram per deciliter if it is a chylothorax. Cholesterol levels are more than 200 milligram per deciliter if it is a cholesterol effusion. And anti B levels may be elevated more than 1500 picogram per ml if it is a LV failure and ADA levels may be 40 in case of tubercular effusions. So now let's talk about the management of pleural effusion. If the effusion is because of a transudative cause, then treating the cause would be sufficient for the resolution of bilateral transudative effusion. 
Let's look at the management of oxidative effusion. The oxidative effusion is different. We have to treat the cause and it is also essential to manage the fluid in the pleural space. So for paranemonic effusion, the first step would be to start all the patients of effusion on empirical antibiotic therapy. The antibiotics alone would be sufficient if the effusion is less than 1 cm thick on the lateral decubitus chest x-ray or the volume of fluid is less than 100 ml. The next step would be to do a therapeutic paracentesis, but it is done if the effusion is more than 1 cm thick on a lateral decubitus chest x-ray. If the effusion is, more, is occupying more than half of hemithorax or it is loculated, then the next step would be to do an ICD placement or the intercostal chest drain insertion and what are the specific indications? They are the loculated pleural effusion, pH less than 7.2 glucose less than 60 mg per deciliter, positive gram stain or culture and gross pus in the pleural space and gross pus in the pleural space. If loculations are present, then through the intercostal drain, you will introduce intrapleural fibrinolytics. They are the tissue plasminogen activator and deoxyribonuclease. When you introduce them, they will result in breakage of the loculations and it will convert the multi-loculated pleural space into one large single locule and which can ease the drainage of the pleural fluid outside. Instead, you can also do a video assisted thoracoscopic surgery where you will manually break the adhesions and will convert the multi-loculated cavity into a large cavity and which will further ease the drainage of the pleural space. When to remove the ICD? If the output has come down to less than 100 to 300 ml per day and the lungs are expanded adequately, then you can remove the intercostal drain. If after removal of the ICD, if it further recurs, then repeat thoracocentesis or chest tube insertion may have to be done in that patient. Finally, after the complete course of antibiotics, after the placement of ICD, even if you do VADs or uh, even if you give intrapleural fibrinolytics, if pleural effusion again recurs, then you have to do decortication. Decortication is nothing but removal of thickened fibrous layer of the visceral pleura. This is indicated in cases of chronic empyema or pleural effusion. Now let's look at the management of malignant pleural effusion. The most common causes of malignant effusions are the lung carcinoma, breast and lymphoma. The diagnosis requires the pleural fluid cytology and more often the cytology may not reveal the malignant cells in the pleural fluid. So further, you need to do a CT or ultrasound guided needle biopsy of the pleura. You can also do a thoracoscopic pleural biopsy. And the management requires chest tube or a pigtail insertion and you need to drain the fluid continuously. And you need to instill a sclerosant like talc or doxycycline through the intercostal tube for the pleurodesis. That is the obliteration of the pleural space because if you are not able to treat the lung carcinoma proper or the metastasis which have uh, happened in the lung proper, then the fluid keeps on depositing in the pleural space. So if you want to obliterate the pleural space, you need to do pleurodesis. For that, you will use talc or doxycycline. Now let's see some important causes of pleural effusion. We have lupus pleuritis and rheumatoid pleuritis. How would you differentiate them? The lupus pleuritis or the Pleural fluid accumulated in the SLE may be clear and the protein levels are low in the exudative range. That is, they are still in the exudative range but towards the lower side. And glucose is equal to that of the serum. When you look at the rheumatoid pleuritis, the fluid is turbid or hemorrhagic in contrast to the clear fluid seen in lupus. And the protein is again low in the exudative range. And the glucose is less than 40. And we have Meek syndrome, which is a triad of the ovarian teratoma or fibroma, ascites and pleural effusion. So this is all about pleural effusion. Hope you found value in this video. If you like this, please share and subscribe this channel. Thank you.